Hello, and welcome to another episode of Such a Nightmare, Conversations About Horror. My name is Catherine Troyer, and joining me, as usual, is Anthony Tresca. Hey there! But what is not per usual is that this very spooktacular episode, we are joined by the author, Paul Tremblay. Hey, <laughs> glad to be here for the spooktacular. Yes. <laughs> So if you were listening to this episode, you probably already know who Paul Tremblay is because he's the reason you're listening. Um, but Anthony and I were particularly excited uh, because hands down, one of my favorite books, period, not even just in horror, period, is 2015's A Head Full of Ghosts. And likewise, The Cabin at the End of the World from 2018, just one of my all-time favorite horror texts. Love oh. it so much. Thank you. This is the best podcast ever. <laughs> <laughs> Yay. The end. Um, and we, we've taught Headful of Ghosts. Um, we will be teaching Cabin at the End of the Woods. Cabin at the End of the World. Sorry. Um, Everybody does that, myself included. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, you know, we just need to have another version so that we can also teach 2020 Survivor Song. All right. So now we're going to jump straight into it. This is going to be an unedited interview. We've given Paul the questions ahead of time, so he's more or less had some time to look over <laughs> it and maybe prepared a thought or two. Uh, so if you want to go ahead and kick us off, Katie. Yes. So the first question is, what is one uninteresting fact about you? I, I verified with Lisa that this was, in fact, very uninteresting. <laughs> but my, my, my second toe is longer than my big toe. Oh. On, on both, both feet? feet? Okay. Yeah, cause... on both feet. Yeah, yeah. That would be interesting if it was just one foot, I think. At least you are uh, outwardly consistent with it. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yeah, that definitely counts as an uninteresting fact. Thank you. <laughs> now that we've got that uninteresting fact out of the way, uh -huh. let's, uh, let's briefly talk about uh, some of your most memorable and formative experiences with horror. Something that, given you that you're a horror writer, is probably important. <laughs> Yeah. So, I mean, I guess I'll break it up a little like time-wise. So, you know, as a child, really for me, I wasn't, uh, you know, sort of embarrassed to admit that I really wasn't a big reader as, as a child or even a teenager. I mean, I was, I was a good student. I, I would do what the teachers asked me to do, but <laughs> I wasn't reading for pleasure. I was really, I don't know, I was a teenager in the 80s. So I would come home, cable was relatively new and I would just watch TV all the time. Um, so for me, my first horror and the earliest formative horror experiences were all films. Um, where I grew up just outside of Boston, there was a, and this was when I was really young, probably, you know, ages seven, eight, nine. Um, there was a program called Creature Double Feature where every Saturday they would show two, uh, two movies in a row. The first movie was always Godzilla or, or, or Gamera. And that's what was the hook for me. And then the second movie would be a, a scarier horror movie. Um, you know, usually like, you know, black and white exploitive exploitation kind of films like Attack of the Giant Killer Shrews, Attack of the Colossal Man, anything with attack in the title. <laughs> um, and those like terrified me, gave me nightmares. Um, Jaws, seeing Jaws when I was 10 or 11 definitely scarred me for life. You know, as much as I love that movie as an adult, I mean, I'm not exaggerating. I've probably seen it 50 times, but I've only seen Quint get bitten in half once. And it was the first time I saw it. So even now when I watch it, I cover my face with a pillow, which is kind of makes it equally horrific because I'm just listening to, to Quint screaming. <laughs> um, reading wise, uh, the formative experience for me was I was a, a math, I, end, I, I started off a math education major as an undergrad. And through uninteresting series of events, I, I had to drop the education part of it and became a double major of math humanities. Um, and the my second semester senior year, I took essentially Lit 101 or you know English 101 class because um, most of my other humanities classes were like history, philosophy, et cetera. Uh, I don't know in that class, I had sort of the stereotype of you know, you know the professor you really bond with. Um, you know, he was a big punk music fan and, and I was too. So I really sort of bought, you know, identified with him over that. Um, but I'll never forget in that, in that course, well, one, we read two short stories that I wrote a paper on. One was T.C. Boyle's Greasy Lake, 
And he's not really considered a horror writer, but it's a very dark story. But the other story was, which is a great story, but the other one was life-changing for me. And it was Joyce Carol Oates's, Where Are You Going? Where Have You Been? And uh, I'll never forget reading that story and like, sort of like discovering, it's like, oh, I, I didn't know people wrote things like this. Um, and on the heels of that, uh, I mentioned Lisa before, she was my girlfriend at the time, and now she's my wife, but she bought me Stephen King's The Stand for my 22nd birthday. So I inhaled that. Um, and when I went off to graduate school for math for two years, I, I was also reading all the King books. And from King, I went to, you know, you know, with the help of Dots McCobb, you know, that book, uh, you know, I discovered Peter Straub and, you know, Shirley Jackson and Clive Barker, et cetera. So I don't know, that's a lot of formatives, but those are all the formatives, I guess. No, that sounds terrific. I, uh, Anthony and I actually like poured over that list and, and danced macabre there at the end where he's like, here are the ones you should read. And we're like, okay, we have to put these in somehow. Um, and I don't know if you had a chance to read The House Next Door um, by Ann River Siddons, but oh. that one was one that I'd never heard of until until reading Dance Macabre. And it, he talks about it in comparison to The Haunting of Hill House. And it's a beautiful section in that book. And then the book itself is it's up there with my favorite horror books of all time. Oh, okay. I'll just have to check it out. So is there a horror text that if someone were to say, you know, oh, I haven't watched or read that, that you would just like tell people to clear their schedule and, and like make time to experience whatever that text is like right away. <laughs> sure. Uh, yeah, I guess I'll go with a, a more recent one for, for a book but it's a book I've been talking about for a few years now because it's one of my favorite short story collections of this century is uh, Things We Lost in the Fire by Mariana Enriquez. Uh, she's an Argentinian writer. I think the book came out maybe probably going on two years now, maybe even three, but oh, it's such a wonderful collection. And you know, the range of stories that so the opening story, The Dirty Kid is one of the most disturbing, creepy stories I've ever read. Um, and it's hard to describe without, without giving away too much. Um, but the story sort of opens where this, this woman, you know, she moved away from her family and she's really living in this, you know, purposely in a sketchy part of the city. And she knows this. And every night there's this kid sleeping outside of her apartment building on a mattress. And, then, and the mother is there, but then sort of not there. And she's trying to help the kid out. And then, you know, things sort of just go horribly <laughs> from there. Um, but it's just, a, you know, such a well-written story. And all of her stories are so well-written and and every story in that collection is different. Like she has a ghost story. She definitely has a lot of socio-political uh, horror stories dealing with what's going on in Argentina. Uh, you know, st you know, stories about gender. You know, she even has like a Lovecraftian story that's you know just really amazing. So yeah, I can't recommend that collection enough. And for movies, I, I proselytize openly for Lake Mungo, um, which is one of my favorite movies. It's uh, I. One of the few movies that I own two copies of the DVD, one that I can always have in my person and the other one to lend out to people. Wow. <laughs> um, you know, my novel After Head Full of Ghosts, Disappearance of Devil's Rock is definitely, you know, Lake Mungo um, inspired in many ways. Yeah, I was reading somewhere that you said that it was inspired by a couple of different Australian horror films. Yeah. Um, it's, there, so there were three. There um, also, I mean, I think Stuart O'Nan's Songs for the Missing, that was a good, you know, text to read too. That's not horror, but it really gets into what happens when, when someone goes missing. Um, but the three Australian movies, Lake Mungo, uh, I mean, the title is a riff on um, Picnic and Hanging Rock. And there's another Australian movie called uh, Snowtown Murders. Um, it's the kind of, it's, it's a brilliant movie, but it's the kind of movie you can only watch once because it's just so disturbing, you know, based on real life, sort of serial killer-ish kind of thing. And um, I mean, it's an amazing movie, but yeah, <laughs> it's it's a tough watch. Yeah, yeah we definitely know a few of those. <laughs> yeah, one of the, the early films that I decided to randomly show Anthony was the, the French film Martyrs. I don't know if you've, and I was like, just watch this. I'm not telling you anything about it. In retrospect, oh I should have prepared him a little bit more than that. Yeah, you made me watch it over my lunch break. I was eating oh, no. that film. <laughs> yeah, I, I have to admit, I haven't had the courage to watch it. Everyone raves about it. I'm just, I have a hard time with like super gory stuff. Uh, really affects me. Um, I'm sure it's a brilliant movie, but yeah, I haven't been able to bring myself to do it. 
I, I was writing a paper uh, looking at it. So I had to like watch the, some of those scenes over and over. And I was like, uh, this is not, this is not what I meant to do with myself. <laughs> well, I think that your last response leads us into our next question a little bit. You talked a little bit about how that more of the body humor and gore kind of freaked you out, but what else scares you in real life and how do those fears play into your own writing? <laughs> uh, I mean, I don't know. I guess it seems trite to say I'm afraid of everything, but I mean, I don't know. I'm, I guess, you know, I'm sort of like, I think many, maybe writers in general, not even horror writers, we're just always spinning through worst case scenarios. Um, and then, you know, that's probably just how I deal with things. Um, yeah, I will say that I won't take as long as I did last to answer the question before about uh, formative experiences. But as a kid, I was definitely, you know, full card carrying scaredy cat, like afraid of the dark. Everything scared me. I slept with, like a fortress of stuffed animals around my head to protect me from, from you know, assorted monsters in the room. <laughs> um, so I don't know. I mean, and that's like when you look back on it, that's, oh, that's sort of like a fun, quaint fear, you know. So there's still that uh, horror appeal on that part of it, where it sort of feels like that part of it can feel roller coasty a little bit. Like we're in the moment, you're terrified, but afterwards you can sort of laugh at it. Um, you know, that's still there, but obviously then the more adult fears sort of came in. And for me in the 80s, the first adult fear was, you know, fear of dying in a nuclear war um, was something I obsessed over, especially when I got into my high school years. Um, and then those, you know, I had those nightmares, which were a lot less fun. Not that <laughs> the other like monster nightmares were fun too, but mm -hmm. those are easier to laugh off in the light of day as opposed to the other ones. Um, you know, I think obviously an abiding sort of interest or, you know, quote unquote fear in my, my novels at least you know this recent crop of novels has been you know fears of parenting and anxieties related to that you know i think when i wrote a head full of ghosts um you know when i started i was like oh this is going to be in response to the exorcist and possession stories and then eventually horror in general and then when i started writing disappear at the devil's rock like i was like oh this is in some ways not like a head full of ghosts but it's oh, another family you know a single mother this time and by the time I got to cabin, I was like, this is all right. This is going to be like, I knew going in, I want to have like a nice, you know, it wasn't a trilogy of books, but it was, I thought it was a cool three book, if not an arc, but at least three different ways or three different types of families and three different ways of exploring the, you know, ambiguous fears in that too. Um, yeah. And I guess the last abiding fear, a holdover from, um, from, you know, my eighties fear of nuclear war is just the fear of that, you know, I'm going to live to see the end of the world. Is definitely something that comes up a lot in my fiction. Obviously, in Cabin at the End of the World, um, but I had a short story collection in 2010 called In the Meantime. I think like 10 out of the 13 stories all dealt with the apocalypse or in the midst of an apocalypse or right before it happened, kind of thing. Do you? So I also have big fears about that because I was I was raised pretty conservatively, so it felt like at every, you know, every other like church meeting and be like end of times it was that is that where the, the fear kind of sparked for you or do you did it just kind of emerge through more unexplained yeah i think it emerged more you know through the 80s i mean my parents were <laughs> briefly catholic i would say you know i made it to like first confession seven years old but that was like the last time although i've been sort of in and around catholic institutions my whole life which is kind of weird um you know as a teacher and even as a student um so now i I can't blame religion on that one for me. <laughs> uh, it was just more, you know, in the eighties. I mean, um, you know, it was just everywhere, even in the pop culture, like movies, like obviously like the dead zone, but war games, I think that came out in 1984. I was obsessed with that movie war games, uh, the Matthew Broderick one, right. Where the computer finally figures out that, you know, you can't win. And even though we, they sort of hacked into uh, whatever the hell the system is called, I was going to call it Skynet, but that's a different <laughs> movie. That's, that's the Terminator. Um, yeah, and now, I mean, just as an adult, you know, with a parent, as a, you know, and a parent, you know, obviously just worrying about climate change and, you know, now we have the fun pandemic, but, you know, before that it was more climate change and everything else that could possibly go wrong. Getting <laughs> into that a little bit, do you, do you think that your fear of uh, seeing the world end and everything go wrong around you has made you better or more ill-prepared for this current pandemic that's going on right now? <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah, ill prepared. Uh, in in mid March, when, when my school in Massachusetts really first went into lockdown, 
it, it sort of coincided with my two week spring break anyway. So I wasn't teaching from home. I had two weeks at home. And I, I was sort of in a metaphorical fetal position, just on the couch watching Animal Planet and Mythbusters. And, you know, <laughs> I, I really couldn't deal. That that was, those two weeks seemed like it lasted for for everybody, I think, like a year. Do you think there's a, a horror world that you would survive? <laughs> no. Uh, well, I initially, my initial response was no. Obviously, it wouldn't be a zombie apocalypse. I've never shot a gun in my life, so I wouldn't be prepared for that. Um, I, I mean, unless like the zombies, like if I could hit them with a basketball, because I'm a good, I'm, I'm a good shot in basketball. But so actually, what I what I eventually wrote down is I think if it was sort of like a werewolf thing or a vampire thing where like the, the, the tropey rules were in place. Like, I think I could avoid a werewolf. <laughs> it's just, if it's just a full moon, you know, I think I could stay away from the area or barricade myself somewhere. I'm not going to go after him. And same thing. If it was like the old school sort of vampires, just get some garlic. <laughs> um, but yeah, I think, that, I think those are the only, yeah, as long as there's like rules like that, I think that's the, my only chance. So moving away a little bit from uh, horror in the abstract in our real world, uh, let's talk a little bit about your experience as a writer. I wonder specifically you could start off by just saying one like particularly gratifying experience for you as a writer to date. Oh yeah, I'm like most of these questions, like I can't, it's hard just to give just one, you know. Um, honestly, for like personally, like something where I felt proud of something I did it's really related to a head full of ghosts because my first two books with a major publisher uh, were sort of like dark, quirky detective novels. And for a variety of reasons that were not my fault, <laughs> um, they didn't sell very well. Um, and that really I don't know, knocked me on my writer's butt for a good, geez, three, almost four years um, where I had a hard time writing and, you know, I spent a lot of time, you know, like I, I'm thankful at least I didn't do this like online, but, you know, in my own head, I was very bitter and jealous. And I, don't know, I had to learn the hard way that, you know, jealousy is the, is the mind killer, is the page killer. You know, nothing good comes from it. Um, and, but, you know, I had to come through that on my own to be able to write a head full of ghosts. And I think it's no, I don't think it's any coincidence just for me, like my own like head and in, in, in writing that. Once I let go of all that stuff, I was open to that. I was open for a story to like that to land in my lap and I was able to, to, to do it. Um, so I'm proud of myself for, I guess, just coming through the other side. Um, other, uh, other fun stuff, obviously just, you know, Stephen King reading and liking the books is a definite highlight. It's amazing. You know, the, you know, the people I've been able to meet that I wouldn't have met otherwise, you know, it includes readers and writers and editors and, and other people like that and musicians like <laughs> I'm a big music nerd and I don't know, I playfully stock my favorite musicians with my writing and I don't know, I've become friends with like some really cool bands that I've, you know, that I've liked and admired. So that's been a highlight too. <laughs> you wouldn't happen to be able to share a couple of those band names that you've performed. Oh, sure. Uh, like, so, so I tend to like punk heavier music. Uh, so a band from the nineties called Helmet. Uh, Paige Hamilton was the lead guitarist singer and he was actually probably the first one that you know, you find out that so many of these people are big readers. Like I named my collection I mentioned in the meantime after Helmet's second second album, Meantime. So I sent him a copy of the book, never thinking I'd hear from him. But yeah, no, we've become friends, we've hung out. Like even like Lisa and me and the kids have gone to Paige's house in LA once. It was pretty cool. You know, I've been to shows and he, he takes me backstage. Um, another band that's been around since the 90s, they're still going strong is a band called Clutch. Uh, they started off as sort of like hardcore and become more like, you know, rock and roll. Like Neil Fallon, again, is a huge reader. He, he's more a science fiction reader. Like he used to read like, I think the Nebula slate every year. Um, but, you know, he's been very cool, very nice guy. Um, British band called the Future of, uh, Future of the Left slash McCluskey. Uh, Andy Falcus is the lead singer. Um, I quoted, I met him because I, in one of the epigraphs of A Head Full of Ghosts is, a, is from a Future of the Left song. Um, and so, you know, we, we just stayed in touch and, and met and, and hit it off. And yeah, so I don't know. It's just, you know, I love music, but I also just love, you know, for me, like what I get out of it, it just helps recharge my batteries, being able to, whether it's music or writing to, you know, just either share the struggle kind of thing or, you know, or just 
be goofy and hang out. You know, there's still something about being able to do that with another creative that, you know, I don't know, helps me like recharge the batteries and, you know, is, makes me more likely to sit down and try writing after, you know, working a full day at work. <laughs> yeah. Very cool. Anthony, I know the next question was one that you had wanted to ask and I kind of put us out of order. Do you want to ask or do you want me to? No, go ahead. Okay. <laughs> so, You're making the test harder. Yeah, so. I know. <laughs> That's right. We're switching <laughs> things up. No. Uh, so one of the, the many, many things that we have talked about I on the podcast also, just kind of between the two of us that we enjoy about your writing is that your books seem to be exploring horror from almost the sort of meta level. Um, and you're, you know, building, but also deconstructing these specific subgenres. You talked about that with Headful of Ghosts, that it was, you know, a direct sort of awareness of the possession narrative, but you've also had the end of the world sort of a subgenre, the post-apocalyptic. So looking at like your reader's notes where you talk about, you know, all the little like puzzles you set for yourself <laughs> and then all that stuff. Why, why do you enjoy playing with horror in these ways? Um, yeah, that's a really good question. In some ways, it's kind of hard to answer. Um, although, I guess what I would say is, hmm, I, I don't know, for, for the novels especially, sorry for the, for the <laughs> delay, for the novels especially, I, I don't know, my default is to try to like play it as, as realistic as I think it can be. You know, in the short stories, and part of that maybe it's just because my own innate agnostic slash atheist for most of my most of my most of my waking time <laughs> not all of it um you know because if i get into a big long story it's like ah that you know would that really happen i mean so that sort of maybe goes to explain some of the ambiguity but not all of it but i i don't know like i guess i'm really interested in like how could this really happen like you know since i'm afraid of so many different things like oh how could we really have you know a, a possession story um that would seem realistic. You know, obviously I never answered the question whether or not she's possessed, but I felt like this is what would happen if, if it was a case that looked like it really would be, you know, possession, that there would be some sort of reality TV crew involved. Um, and so when I approach it from, but, but I also want to approach it from a way that, so there's that. I also want to approach it from, and try to give the readers credit. Like, you know, they've read, even if they've never read horror before, just by being a person aware of the culture, they're going to know so many of these tropes just from being around. And so, you know, I have a really difficult, I would, I, I think it becomes partly meta just because I want to show to the readers like, Hey, I know, you know, <laughs> like, you know, without getting jokey, like, I don't want to be scream. Not that scream is a bad movie. Like I'm not, I'm not trying to write like a horror comedy. I want it to be real and quote unquote serious. So I'm trying to balance, like, I know what's, what has come before and maybe trying to find my own way to, to make, put a little, some sort of twist on it that makes it seem, if not new again, nothing's, I guess, ever really new again, but at least fresh in some way. Um, and I don't know, and we live in a postmodern world. I mean, it's, <laughs> you know, the idea that we are daily questioning, I mean, just this weekend, like with, you know, Trump testing for COVID, like all these people um, like wouldn't, you know, I'm sort of on, I'm not sort of, I'm on the side of, you know, science in, in, in the party of, of rational choices, but even like people sort of on my side of the political fence were like right away, oh no, he's, you know, instant conspiracy theory. Oh no, he, he's not, you know, he's not actually sick, this, 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 and this. And I know it just continually blows me away how <laughs> we, we are living in like postmodern, postmodern society. It was certainly a post, or a post-truth society or a post-information society. I don't know where like everything is questioned all the time, every day, and it's exhausting. Um, so, I mean, all that stuff definitely gets thrown in, particularly in with A Head Full of Ghosts, actually the four novels, I'd say all four definitely have those sort of what's, you know, how can we trust anything that's going on sort of anxieties in there. Yeah, it's, I mean, that, re that really comes out particularly, I think in Survivor Song, your most recent one, particularly seems like a, a comment on this that postmodern world that we're all forced to live in and that you seem to identify by based on my reading you attribute a lot of it to technology and that escalation of it which is very yeah, thank you <laughs> yeah um it's funny because with that book like in going into it I'm like i know i can't do ambiguous horror all the time i was happy to do it for the three novel arc that i sort of discussed 
but like I, ne I never want to just put it in there to have it be my thing or to be a gimmick it, it has to it has to be part and parcel of the theme it ha i mean it has to be the theme really uh, of the book for it to be there so when i was writing survivor song i was like oh this is not going to be this is not an ambiguous book um it's this going to have an ending although i tried to playfully pretend there was an ambiguous ending <laughs> for those that have read it <laughs> um but i mean like as you said anthony it, you know some of it sneaks in just the idea that you know on the facebook page you know you can laugh at you can recognize like some of those comments but um at the same time it's just it it goes to reflect you know our current anxious our current anxiousness given like the amount of misinformation that's being spewed at us yeah i wonder if you couldn't go a little bit deeper you were already kind of touching on this a little bit in the previous question but what specifically do you keep in mind when you're crafting these characters that have to exist within the horror framework, but also these real life situations? Um, yeah, so, so for the characters, it's weird. I mean, a lot of it, honestly, a lot of it, you know, I'm try I go off of feel. Like, I think that's one of the biggest steps for younger writers that's the hardest is learning to like trust your subconscious. Um, you know, but also learning when to sort of wrestle something into place. I mean, it's, it's, I can't point to when you're supposed to do it. You know, it, it just comes through feel a little bit. Um, so generally with my characters, I mean, with the exception of, with the exception of maybe Redmond, if that's his real name in cabin. And, you know, with the exception of, you know, some of the pseudo militia guys in, in uh, survivor song, you know, I try to approach every character from a place of empathy. Um, and, you know, empathy to me is important for any fiction writer. I mean, I, I take that job seriously because, you know, you know, as an educator, there are reams of studies that, you know, study like people who read fiction tend to be able to be more empathetic to people who aren't them or who don't look like them. And I, and I, I don't know, I take that, I take that as a call to arms for, for fiction writers. That's what you should be doing. There should be empathy over sympathy. Um, you know, nothing makes me like dismiss someone's opinion faster than, oh, I didn't like that character. Or I couldn't sympathize with that character. You're not supposed to. You know, and sympathy is easy. Sympathy is rooting for the home team. Sympathy is why we're in the mess we're in. Sympathy is, oh, that person looks and talks and acts like me. You know, so that's why I like them. No, empathy is what makes some of us human. Empathy is, you know, the want to understand someone else, even if they're doing something we find you know, distasteful or even villainous, like, but still we want to understand like how they got there and how we might've ended up in that same spot. So I don't know, I, almost all my characters have, I'll, I'll pose them sort of the story questions that I, I pose myself first. And then at some point in the book, they become their own characters in some ways, but there's still like a little piece of, you know, a little piece of, me asking the same questions and maybe it's just a different part of me that is doing what they're doing now kind of thing. Well, I can tell you as a reader, I, I definitely, I have the feels every time I read one of your books, I'm <laughs> like, I just, I feel in the best way possible raw inside because I, I can't just separate it, you know, as, as fluff, right? Like it, it's making me be a human uh, in the best way possible. So you are definitely keep going with your gut because it is a hundred percent working. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, yeah, my editor used to joke I was Mr. Ambiguous Horror, but now I just, now we're calling it uh, sad horror. <laughs> ah. I write sad horror. Yeah, sure. <laughs> I was actually thinking that that you did kind of deserve your own genre, like haunting instead of horror, because it's it, it's not. It is. It's different, but in in a way that I think is really good, which actually leads me to our next question. So we talk a lot. Um, in our podcast about this this framework that was crafted by a, a scholar named Linda Holland Toll, and she said that you know you can really kind of see on a continuum disaffirmative horror and affirmative horror. And she says that affirmative horror ends up at the end of the day showing that um, because the systems have been threatened, but at the end of the day we triumph and and over and ch achieve greatness. That you know. The structure is not the problem. The, the threat on the outside is. Whereas disaffirmative horror 
uh, you know, lifts the curd that sheet up and it's like, see that body? See that monster? That is you. You are the monster. <laughs> so where would you place, and, and it may be different for different books of yours, but where would you place your horror on this framework in terms of, you know, you've already said that horror should make us empathize, but, but what else should it do as it's engaging with its audience? Yeah. Uh, um, I'll back up a little bit and say, I mean, what I do is I try to start from empathy. I mean, I think the cool thing about horror is there's so many ways you can do it, right? You, like you can still be successful and you don't have to have empathy clearly for all the characters, like a film like Get Out, obviously, you know, we're not supposed to have empathy for, you know, the white people that live in that town because they're representative of uh, an oppressive society, right? Um, it's just, I'm not as talented as <laughs> obviously, you know, Jordan Peele. So like, I kind of have to stick with what, what I do. Um, I, I thought a lot about this question. I liked the words too, the affirmative versus dif disaffirmative because that, that's close to how I sort of, I wrote a little essay that was in the paperback of A Head Full of Ghosts um, talking about progressive versus conservative horror. Um, and I don't necessarily mean it's, you know, horror written by, you know, Democrats and or written by, you know, uh, Republicans. It was more just in how uh, the essence to me of a horror story is that th there's some truth revealed. And it's usually a horror, obviously it's a horrible truth of some kind. Um, and to me, progressive horror, so I guess in this case, we're probably more leaning towards disaffirmative, but in my mind, progressive horror represents the truth after the horror truth has been revealed, but the truth that nothing stays the same, everything's going to change. So, and you know, the movie, The Exorcist and the book, The Exorcist, for example, obviously, you know, one of the scariest movies and books, you know, in the genre, but at the same time, I, I think there's a, uh, maybe failing is too strong a word, but I think sort of the post end doesn't work because, you know, it is such a, it is such a conservative, in story structure or reactionary story structure, whereas the status quo is is restored at the end of the movie. You know, Reagan doesn't even remember anything. In the movie, it's like everyone's sunny and happy. Um, it's like, no, if they went through this, they would be fundamentally changed by everything that happened to them. So I don't know, I, I tend to judge horror by, you know, the change part of it. Like, you, you know, even as the twist ending, like something like the lottery, for example, the twist at the end, sort of certain that what the change part of it comes from, like how you view the, the rest of the story that came before it. Um, that's a very disaffirmative horror story because I mean the the twist is really the reveal of the horrible truth that, you know, <laughs> what we're you know what this town is doing to itself. So, yeah, I don't know. So I mean, I guess what I'm saying is I think more of in terms of like, I'm trying to my big reveal. I try to make come like at the two thirds point. Um, at least with the ambiguous novels, we'll call them. <laughs> I tried to have that happen. Um, and then, you know, for each one, I was like, oh, so what are they going to do now? Like, I mean, that's why I wanted to write A Head Full of Ghosts was I wanted the attempted exorcism to happen like the two thirds point. And then I really wanted to dig in is what are they going to do after that? Like, that's really interesting to me. You don't see, you don't really see that in any of the, the movies. I mean, you maybe see like the 30 seconds afterwards or two minutes afterwards, but you don't get like a whole act after that. Um, I don't know, that's really long and rambly, but that's the best I can do with that question. If you don't mind me asking a bit of a maybe probing question sure. about that answer. Uh, Katie has made the claim that affirmative horror can't be nearly as satisfying as disaffirmative horror on the podcast. And you seem to be talking to us, getting at it a similar way in how you talked about how The Exorcist is more of an example of uh, what was your word again? Progressive and uh... oh, progressive and progressive and yeah, I guess conservative. Did they call it reactionary? Yeah, or reactionary. Yeah. yeah. And do you think that that is also the same? Uh, that constr uh, that conservative type of uh, horror is not as satisfying as progressive horror, where that trauma forces you to change. Well, look, I mean, I, I certainly can't speak for everybody. I can only speak for me. I mean, I, there are plenty of people out there who love seeing the monster defeated and everyone happy at the end. That, that's just not me. It's just, it, it rings hollow. And I, I don't know, maybe that means I can't read for escape. And I'm not trying to say that, you know, people who can, there's something wrong with them. It's just not me. Like I don't read for escape. I read to be, uh, to be myself, if that makes sense. 
you know, it's not to say like, I don't like Evil Dead 2 was one of my favorite movies, but I think there's some really subversive stuff happening in that movie. Um, even, even in so far as like how it's being presented to us visually. Um, so, I mean, I don't want to just say blanket statement doesn't work, but I mean, it's going to be really hard to tell a story where, <laughs> and it's not to say you can't have a happy ending too, but you can have people survive. You can have like a, a quote unquote good outcome, but the survivors are going to be fundamentally scarred, fundamentally changed by that. And I think the story owes it to those characters to honor 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 their experience to honor that change um because when it doesn't i don't know it just doesn't feel right it doesn't feel real um i'm trying to think you know so like alien versus aliens you know aliens to me isn't even really a horror movie i'm not, I'm not typically that kind of person either like i think horror is a big wide umbrella but but that you know that is a very conservative story arc and it, i mean they literally <laughs> they literally put together the family unit at the end of the movie, right? And you're cheering, you know, but there's no cheering in horror. <laughs> you know, I cheer too when, when, when Sigourney kicks ass at the end of the movie. So, I mean, it's an action movie. It's not, it's not a horror movie, but Alien, where, you know, she's literally, you know, even though she defeats, I mean, it's sort of a happy ending, defeats the alien. She's, you know, at the end of that movie, she's as alone, as cosmically alone as you could be with the knowledge that most of us are as weak you know, weaker than a kitten, right? The cat survived, outlived most of her crew. I mean, that's a horrifying ending. Um, anyway, but um, does that go towards a little bit more <laughs> what you were asking about? Yeah, absolutely. Because uh, we often talk about, you know, S Stephen King has a lot of, you know, and then they all live happily ever after feels to it. But the ones that stick with me the most, uh, the shining misery are the ones where, you know, we're reminded, yeah, they may have survived, but did right. they really survive? <laughs> uh, you know, and so that's, yeah, that, that makes me happy that we're on the same page with that. Um, so when the class that, that we teach here at Trinity um, meets a creative expression requirement, and so students are writing sometimes period for the first time, but, but a lot of them are writing horror for the first time. So what do you think are some of the sort of key elements to writing successful horror that you would just tell anyone, no matter what stage they're at, uh, to kind of stick to or think about? <laughs> I'm laughing because on my list, I can't, well, people are listening. I wrote down a list and I just wrote key elements, question mark. I never answered it. <laughs> um, uh, I mean, for, for writers that are first starting, I would, I would tell them to not be afraid to to, to not be afraid to take like a kernel of something from something that they've really liked. Like if they're not sure what to do, like it's okay to go to another movie as a starting point. Um, or, you know, cause I mean, I think every artist starts off on some level as a mimic, whether it's music, I'm still in the mimic music stage. I play guitar. <laughs> um, you know, then at a certain point you kind of hope that your personal experience, which is unique, um, sort of takes over and, and, and changes the story. But I don't know, I think we, for me, we've dis we've discussed some of the key elements. I think, I think if you can, I think I wish just more horror, horror writers would just trust their readers more, like that they would trust them that they, they, they've seen, <laughs> they've seen and read many horror things. Um, and try not, you know, try not to just like cynically try to, you know, slip the same thing under their noses again. Um, or if you're going to, you know, give them the same sort of plot story, then it, something has to be different with the characters. And I don't know, some, sometimes that can be fun, even as an exercise, like, hey, you have to take this sort of rote plot thing. And, and, and for me, I always go characters first. Like I typically get, if I get a story idea, I typically know the beginning and the end. The end might be a little foggy, but I, I sort of know where I want to end up. And then it's like the whole middle swath, whether it's a novel or a short story I have to make up. Um, and for me, it's uh, that's where I really go to the characters. Um, I don't know, and steal characters. When I say steal, like from people you know, all the characters. <laughs> so many of them start with either like the physical characteristics of someone I know, or you know, or a name, or something like that. So I don't know key elements. I'm not really answering this question very well. That's why I teach math and not writing. <laughs> no, I think you're doing a fantastic job. So speaking of stealing names. Was it was it something like on your bucket list that you would have a character named after yourself that you could kill off? Like, 
Uh, yeah, poor Paul. He he's five eight though. That oh five ten. That character, and I'm six four. So oh, okay. that's why I've been saying he's clearly not me. Um, <laughs> no, the novel I'm working on now, <laughs> I'm 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 full on leaning into like autobiographical stuff. It's being written as a fake memoir of someone who's probably me, um, but writing the memoir under a sort of a ridiculous name. Um, so that's been sort of a different experience because I am taking a character and I'm purposely using many things that have happened to me, but it's also like really exaggerated and it's not me at the same time. So it's, it's kind of fun. I usually don't say that about writing, which probably means it sucks. <laughs> uh, Cause usually the things I write, it's just, I'm not having a fun time when I'm writing it. I love being done. That's what I'm addicted to. I love having like the novel finished. For me, that's the high being able to show it to a few people. But while I'm writing it, oh, no, it's work. It's hard. So good to hear. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's good to hear that it's not just difficult for us. <laughs> no, no. I, on a bit of a more slightly fun note, uh, I was wondering if you could maybe talk a little bit about a, just a random person, a t hypothetical situation here. Who would you want to collaborate with in the horror industry, either living or dead? Uh, and why? Um, I mean, there's so many, so I can't, you know, again, I'm not going to give you one. Living, I would go with my really good friend, John Lang, and we've sort of talked about maybe doing it, but it's hard because, you know, we're both so busy. But I would love to write with John. One, like, because the secret to collaborating with somebody is gonna, they have to be better than you, which, which is easily the case with John. And I think it would be interesting because his and our, his style and mine are so different. Um, it could be kind of interesting to see what happened. Uh, I co-wrote a, a novel with Stephen Graham Jones once, uh, a young adult novel. It's called The Floating Boy and the Girl Who Couldn't Fly, you know, for a small independent publisher under the name P.T. Jones. We just sort of smushed our, our names together. And that was a lot of fun. I think Stephen's, at least, you know, sentence level, Stephen and me have a similar style at times. So that wasn't too hard. The hardest part for me was though, Stephen just writes so damn fast. Like I would write, two weeks on a chapter and I'd send it back to him. He'd send it back to me the next day. I'm like, Steven, you're killing me. <laughs> um, also alive, very much alive. Uh, it's Clive Barker's birthday. So I, I kind of have to choose Clive Barker. You know, I would love, I don't think he gets enough credit for influence. Um, like maybe it's partly because he went like a whole bunch of years without writing a whole lot. But, you know, you know, after reading King and, and more and Peter Straub is certainly a formative influence of mine, but with Clive, he was like the first time I really felt unsafe reading something like, <laughs> you know, just from a sense of imagination, but also like this guy is going to could do anything. And I, I don't know what he's going to do. And I just, just felt really unsettled by like, I you know had no chance of guessing what was going to happen um, for dead Shirley Jackson. Although I have a sense, you know, she would probably, <laughs> I don't know how much I would be able to, to write that Shirley just wouldn't take over and do a much better job with. Um, and similar to John, like uh, Roberto Bolaño, I, you probably wouldn't have any patience to, to work with a, a schlub like me, but I'd love to, you know, if he was alive, come on, Roberto, let's do a short story <laughs> together. <laughs> Reading a little bit about, I don't know if you're able to talk about this, and I don't know what, at what point in development these projects are, but I was wondering if you could talk maybe about the upcoming collaborations with the film versions of A Head Full of Ghosts and The Cabin at the end of the world which, by the way congratulations that's so exciting thanks thank you um so yeah i can't say a whole lot although i mean a head full of ghosts is the closest um it's been close like they come really close a few times you know i think if covid covid hadn't happened besides all the people that would have you know lived and been much happier um a head full of ghosts probably would have filmed the summer um so we'll see i'm hopeful that you know if things get better and, and you know movies can start filming you know they might start filming it at some point you know they have a director scott cooper and um they have some casting including margaret qualley to play adult mary um yeah so fingers crossed that happens uh i'm really not much of a collaborator like i have no say in anything uh you know i haven't worked on the screenplays at all yeah, i'm not quite sure what's happening with the cabinet at the end of the world at the moment um hopefully i get to make an announcement soon with whom, but it looks like uh, Survivor Song is going to be optioned as well. So that, which is cool. So we'll see. Congratulations. Thanks. That's so Thanks. exciting. Yeah. 
one of the things that I admire, so I'm a very fast reader and I, and I find myself reading really quickly and I'm like, no, slow down and appreciate the beautifully constructed sentences <laughs> he's giving us. Um, you, you do, you have an amazing sort of well, way you. with, with language. Is there, if you right now on the spot, could you pick one favorite word? No. <laughs> well, it's funny when I was thinking about this question, I was like, oh, like, what's the word that I use way too much? <laughs> um, uh, you know, I, I take it back. My favorite word is dowsing, like dowsing for water. Like, you know, you used to have people ever heard of that? Like people are like, yeah. oh, I have a stick and I can find where water is in the ground. Uh, yeah, it's such a, like a weird thing. I like the word. So I've used it in a few stories, like as a, you know, a metaphor or, or a simile, like, you know, dowsing for something. Is it the yeah. sound that you like, or is it the the act like the idea of it, or both? I think yeah, I think it's more uh, the the sound is pleasing, but I think it's more just the for me the image of, of an actual dowser with the sticks. I remember as a kid, I used to look for a dowsing stick. Um, yeah, I'm glad I remember that. It's <laughs> a great word. That is an incredible word, and I love the dowsing rods that they have as well. Dowsing rod is also a fun phrase to say. Dowsing rod, yeah. It's almost, it's, is it cellar door? It almost is. I think <laughs> it is. <laughs> Coming soon to a new horror novel near you. <laughs> so what is one thing that if you could, you know, sort of whisper into your readers' ears while they're getting ready to start reading your books, one of your books, or maybe while they're reading it, like, what do you wish that you could kind of just be like, hey, you, there's something I want you to think about. Like, what would that, what would you say to them? Oh, I would have to put my arm around them and talk to them for a good long time. So, <laughs> um, I don't know. I, I initially wrote down, because I didn't think about this one, like, it was hard to come, well, hard not to just like write like paragraphs, but like, I don't know, maybe, you know, don't be in a rush to be, to see what happens next, because that's not, I don't write those kind of books. Although I guess Survivor Song sort of comes close to being sort of a, you know, big plot, you know, driven by plot kind of story. Um, I don't know, I mean, because that reflects my favorite kind of books. Like plot to me, plot is like lower, much lower on my list of interests as a reader compared to um, character and mood and voice. Um, and then plot for me is probably fourth. Um, <laughs> if I was, if I had a few drinks and I was feeling really sort of <laughs> cheeky, uh, you know, especially in regard to the, the three novels that, you know, play with the ambiguity, <laughs> I would probably say when you're done with a book, you, you need to ask yourself and be honest with yourself as to why you're upset with an ambiguous ending. Cause I have, I have theories. <laughs> uh, I have theories about why, Obviously not everybody, because I, I can't paint everybody in the same brush, but um, I don't know. I think I'll say it. Damn it. <laughs> um, I don't know. I, I, I do think, you know, there's something about sort of the dominant Christian culture in the United States in particular that makes it difficult for a lot of readers to deal with ambiguity. Because, you know, in all three of those books, really the larger ambiguous question that hangs over everything, besides the fact that, hey, you know, ambiguity really sort of reflects our state of memory, you know, our memories are a lot more malleable than, than we like to believe they are. Our identities are a lot more malleable, even our existence. Um, and I think it, any sort of ambiguity left hanging, I think <laughs> to me automatically reflects to the ultimate ambiguous question at the end of all of our lives, what happens when we die? And we don't know, I'm sorry, you don't know. You could believe you know something, but at the core of it, you actually really don't know. And I think for a lot of readers, they can't handle that. Um, I understand why. I'm not saying, <laughs> um, I don't know. I think it's maybe something that some people just don't want to reflect on. I get that. But I don't know, as a horror writer and as a worst case scenario sort of person, those are the kind of things I tend to think about. So, yeah. And we've, talk we've talked about that a lot, Anthony and I have, because I... I'm not usually a fan of ambiguous endings, but I'm usually not a fan because I think that the writers are are cheating right that they're they're saying mm. reach into the grab bag and whatever you pull out is the source of horror that's what it is and and i never felt that way and in, in any of your quote ambiguous uh horrors like I, I felt like you knew what was in the bag uh whether or not we pulled out 
something that was expected or not might be a whole different situation. But I just, right. um, I think that's my big thing is that I need the author to not have an answer, but to know that he, he or she has made it ambiguous on purpose. Uh, so, right. No, I mean, and listen, I, I totally get, it. especially in a novel, it's, it's hard to ask readers to, to read 300 pages and then maybe not have an answer to, you know, at least plot wise, the central question. But, you know, as we sort of talked about, you know, and, and, and certainly like there are plenty of bad ambiguous endings, as you said, it can just feel like the author is like, oh, I'm not sure. Uh, or there isn't a reason or it isn't a part of, you know, it isn't a part of the thematic why of the story. Like a head full of ghosts to me, what is one of the most horrific parts is that, you know, that that central ambiguous, you know, the ambiguity to me is the book. Like that's the story. Um you know, and with the ending, I feel like I kind of, I tried to restate the, uh, to restate sort of the central premise, the original question of whether or not something supernatural is happening. And the whole book, it starts there, but then you get all this data, you get all these zero and ones, so I'm going to go mathy for a minute. You know, so really, it, it feels like there's all these other questions, and then I don't know, I, I'm almost like restating the, almost like getting to restate the, um, restate, oh my God, I'm, I'm losing my mind restate sort of the purpose of the book, you know, toward the end. Um, but, you know, so that book and Cabin really quickly, the ambiguous, I approach it somewhat differently or a little bit differently, I think, just insofar as with, you know, because people ask me all the time, is there an ending to this book? You know, or what, what's, or what did you imagine the ending was? Like, well, with, it, with Ed Full of Ghosts, there is none. Like, honestly, I tell people, I purposely tried to build the scale so you know, the sides of there's something supernatural going on or there's not something supernatural going on. And yeah, if something supernatural going on, there's a few other options, I suppose. But to me, that's like the central scale. Like, I don't know. I, I purposely tried to divorce myself from that, um, that question. Not that it's not important. You know, I think it's kind of cool to think about. But with Cabin, I mean, I kind of approached the same way in trying to build the case for both. But with Cabin at the end of the world, it was a little bit different. It became for me as a writer, and I, I guess maybe not so for a lot of readers, that the ending, um, it, it wasn't important to me if the world was gonna end or not. Or to me, in my mind's eye, the story became about Eric and Andrew's choice. What was the choice they were gonna make? That, that became the novel as opposed to A Head Full of Ghosts where was, the ambiguity was the central core of it. Um, so you know, when people ask about the ending of that book, I tell them, and this is 100% honest, I have not thought one nanosecond past the last line of that book. Um, anyway, wow, that was a big ramble. I told you guys before we started that I, I ramble. <laughs> I mean, no, I'm soaking it up and I can tell Anthony is too. He's got like his thinking face on big time. Oh yeah. I'm going to be thinking about these responses for days to come. I can just tell you that now. <laughs> All right. Moving on to our final question. This is our last one that we have time for. I was just wondering if uh, looking back at yourself as a young writer, what advice would you give to that young Paul Tremblay? Oh boy. I mean, like, you know, like, I mean, there were so many small mistakes along the way, but I don't know, there was value in learning it. Uh, so I don't know if I would necessarily tell young Paul <laughs> to avoid all those mistakes, but I me, mean, I would tell him, we sort of talked about this a little bit that tell him that, you know, it, you know, don't dream like, oh, I'm going to get to a point where it's just going to be easy and I'm just going to be able to knock out all this stuff. It doesn't get easier. Um, and I hope that's both like frustrating and sort of a little bit of a bomb. Um, and, you know, now that I'm here, I'm, I'm sort of, look, I, I want it to be easier, but I'm also sort of glad because I think if I felt like it was easy, I, I think I, I, I wasn't, I think I wouldn't, if I thought it was easy, then I think that would mean that I'm not pushing myself in some way. Um, so, you know, I never want to, you know, I never want to feel that way about it. I don't know. Cause it's still like for so many writers, like I still have a day job that I, if anyone's listening, I hope to quit at some point but <laughs> soon. Um, but you know, for so many people, so many of us, it's a sacrifice to write, like, unless it's your day job, like you're sacrificing, is something is, I mean, and this isn't little, is something as little as like watching a movie that you want to watch. But, you know, so many of us are sacrificing maybe, you know, not, you know, I try, you know, I'm first and foremost, I'm a husband and a father as well, you know, so I don't try to take time away from, from that, but, you know, 
I, I'd be lying if I said if it didn't happen on, on some on, on some points. So I don't know if it's so if I'm going to sacrifice some parts of my life that I enjoy, then it better damn well be worth it. <laughs> um, so I guess I'm, I'm sort of glad it's hard, although I really wish it was easy too. <laughs> The duality. <laughs> yeah, the ambiguity of everything I say. I guess. <laughs> well, thank you so much. Um, from the moment that, that we first started talking, uh, from the moment that you liked one of our social media moments, and then, you know, Anthony <laughs> and I did happy dances, um, and then I remembered that social media isn't as terrible as I think it is most of the time, um, to now, you it's just been so neat um, to get to, to talk with you because we've been not just moved by your works, but we've been forcing it upon others so that they can also be moved by it because it just, I think you're where horror needs to be right now. So thank you so very much. No, that's very kind of you. Thank you. This was a lot of fun. And no, please. I mean, thank you for, I mean, obviously I, I, I'd heard that you guys have been teaching some of these, you know, in classes. So, I mean, oh, I mean, that it was just exciting. And I'd heard about your podcast, I think, because you guys used uh, a paper that, someone who had contacted me had written about a head full of ghosts. Like he, mm -hmm. he showed me his paper a few years ago. I was like, Hey, they're talking about my paper. It's like, you should listen to it. So I did. And, and um, I don't know, you guys are obviously, you know, super smart and I enjoyed like just how much energy and thought you put into the book. So, you know, please thank you on multiple fronts. Thank you again. Just for, I want to say it as well. I want to make sure that my thanks is <laughs> to you as well. <laughs> Noted. <laughs> um, so in the meantime, is there anything you want to plug? Any, anything you want to get out to our listeners? Um, yeah, you know, also Survivor Song came out in July. Uh, also, sort of weird. I'm not quite sure why they did it, but like the same day Survivor Song came out, the paperback of uh, Growing Things and Other Stories came out. Um, so if you like short stories, you know, hopefully, and if you've read A Head Full of Ghosts, there are a couple of stories that have connections to that, to that novel, so. I know yeah. that we both just got that one, so we look forward to reading that. All uh, right. In the meantime, to our listeners, feel free to uh, uh, share our podcast with, with your friends. Give us a like. Our social medias are in the description. And in the meantime, thank you so much again, Paul, for joining us. And thank you, everybody else, for tuning in. Thank, thank you. you, Katie and Anthony. Yeah.